So um, anyways, getting back to asking questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, click on the three dots icon and click Q&A and that will make it appear on your screen and all those questions um, I'll address at the end of the presentation. So um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Lindsay Otis, the Sonoma and Mendocino technical winemaker for Lafort USA. Somehow in my six and a half years at Lafort, I've become the sparkling wine go-to person um, for Lafort USA. Although um, this presentation is mostly derived from Francois Baton and he's um, Lafort's sparkling wine guru from Champagne based in Europe. Um, he comes out here every once in a while. Um, and anyway, so today we will um, we'll discuss production of baseline for traditional method, AKA method champenoise, um, which is the bottle fermented version of sparkling wine. Um, today we'll be walking through the processes and parameters to set you up for creating a successful and quality driven sparkling baseline. So we'll go over choice of grape varietals and ripeness, um, timing of harvesting and fruit handling, pressing, how to press properly, juice preparation prior to fermentation, and we will also be going over several steps you can take after juice preparation to ensure a quality baseline prior to tirage bottling. So we'll talk about primary fermentation, the strategy of malolactic fermentation, blending, and then both protein and tartaric stabilization. So what's the difference between a great wine and a mediocre wine? Well, when consumers are drinking um, traditional method sparkling, generally they expect wines with elegance, finesse, freshness, complexity. So as winemakers, what can we do to enhance these characteristics? Well, we can choose varietals that tend to show those characters more. We can choose the level of ripeness to express them. And we can do things to affect aging potential, which will allow those characteristics to shine longer through the wine's life. So these are the varietals that you'll most likely see in the sparkling world, although most widely used, of course, are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, um, but there are plenty of options to make quality sparkling base wine. Um, however, with some varietals like Riesling and Shenan, the aromatic profile is so different from their youth um, than when it is when they're aged. Uh, they develop these like intense petrol characters over time and they can become quite um, heavy and cooling. So those varietals really are best suited for Charmant. Um, where the wine doesn't really age for so long before bottling. So this being said, um, what are the ideal maturity parameters for a sparkling wine? So alcohol, of course, shouldn't exceed 11 to maybe 11.5%. Um, the second most important parameters are pH and TA. Uh, with pHs over 3.15, you probably um, won't want to undergo malo. Uh, when you're 2.9 to 3.1, you still have the option to go through malo. Um, and ideally, your finished wine will be around 3.15 to 3.2. Um, so that would make your starting pH be around 3. And then for TA, you're targeting 10 to 15 grams per liter, um, which is high, but that doesn't really mean underripe because ideally your malic acid content will be about a third of what your TA is. Um, when your malic is like 50% of your TA, which is just too high, you'll start to notice these kind of green apple notes and just green characters in general. And, in, and those wines can be perceived as, as underripe. 
So the major challenge of growing and producing sparkling wine in warmer climates, um, picking before the sugar loading finishes on the vine, is that there's a tendency to pick underripe and that you don't really get the balance of acidity um, because your malic acid's so high and the acidity is um, very noticeable and you have these green kind of flavors. And this is an issue because the effervescence of the wine um, will amplify those aromas by about 30%. So now we have uh, exactly what we want from the grapes. Let's take a look at where those parameters are located in the grapes. Um, so in the stems, um, we have tannins, oxidases, mineral salts, herbaceous flavors, not really things we want to extract. Then we have the peripheric area, and this is the skin of the grape and the first layer of cells that's like near to the pulp. This area is high in potassium, <clears throat> mineral salts, polyphenol oxidase, primary and varietal aromas, polyphenols, um, which are problematic for us, <clears throat> astringency, and it's low in sugar and acids. Mm. After that is the uh, intermediate area. And that's basically the pulp. Um, it's rich in sugar and it's rich in tartaric acid. And then we have the central area, um, which is it's right around the seeds. And that's also rich in malic acid, but it's not really always welcome for the sake of the balance of the acidity. And it's also low in sugar. And then if you press hard enough and aggressively, um, you could extract the oil and tannins from the seeds. And the seed oil is typically an anti-foaming agent, which could be damaging to the bubble formation. So another anti-foaming agent um, I should mention is the wax on the skin in the herbaceous area. So that's like the light layer of white on the berry that you can wipe off with your finger. You can't really separate that out, but you can kind of clean it up, and we'll talk about that a little, a little later. So looking at the traditional method-based wine production, you're organizing harvest, transport, press loading, pressing, in order to extract the minimum possible quantity of compounds coming from the peripheric area, the central area, um, the stems and the seeds. So how do we achieve this? Well, bottom line is you want to do hand picking. Um, in order not to crush the skin, you have to harvest by hand. And in Champagne, they use these small boxes to transport the fruit, and that minimizes the self-crushing of grapes. So those boxes, they're, you know, 50 kilos max, 100 pounds, um, and it's important to have drilled holes or slotted boxes so that any oxidized juice that builds up will flow away from the grapes. And the time between picking and loading a press should be minimized to prevent oxidation. All right, so when it arrives to the press, um, the optimum conditions for decreasing phenolic extraction is to do whole cluster pressing. Um, so that really eases um, the draining in the press because you keep the stems in there. And so therefore you limit the contact with the skins and any maceration. So make sure you keep the clusters whole and intact before you begin pressing. So whether you're using the cocard press, which is on the right, and then, or um, bladder press on the left, uh, make sure you load it very gently. And you see in the bladder press picture here, um, you have two doors to fill the press. So you don't need to rotate the press in order to fill it um, because as soon as you turn the press, you're gonna extract compounds from the skin. So that's color, polyphenols, polyphenol oxidase, lipidic compounds, which are anti-foamers, and even conveyor belts have a risk of extracting. So. Ideally, you load your picking bins directly into the press. So 
So now let's have a close look at the champagne pressing cycle. Um, basically, the principle is to apply the minimum amount of pressure required for the flow of juice without extracting um, phenolics through maceration. So you load the press, you do a quarter turn if you're using a bladder press um, so that you're exactly on the drains. And this is the juice before you begin pressing, the, the pre-press free run juice. It's also called auto pressing juice. This rinses off the dirt and the wax that you have on the berries. So when that juice stops flowing, then you start your pressing. So you go up to 0.2 bar, you maintain that pressure and eventually the skins are gonna crack and the juice from the pulp will begin to flow. And knowing that there's stems um, creates a lot of channels in the press to avoid the maceration phenomenon. So before you go to the next pressure step, um, never let the pressure go down at all. Um, as soon as the flow stops, then you apply 0.4 bar, maintain that pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as you reach about 1.2 bar, um, you usually have too much compaction um, preventing proper draining. So um, when you reach that level, um, you're gonna have to turn the press before you can start a new cycle. And anyway, that's pretty much the champagne pressing principle. Um, so now we're gonna look at pressing details. Um, this diagram shows the turbidity of the juice for four tons of grapes. So you have the first fraction, um, the cuvee, uh, which is the best fraction, and that goes to about 2,000 liters. And then you have the tie, which is about 550 liters. And then you have the first and second tie, which you can also separate. So what happens to the turbidity of the juice? Um, if I have four tons, the first few hundred liters are gonna be pretty turbid as that's some of the auto pressing juice. So the dirt, the dust, wax, that's all included and it winds up being browner. Um, this auto pressing juice should be included with the second tie, um, the worst quality juice in the fractioning. Uh, anyway, the R1 in this diagram is the first rotation of the press, and as soon as you do that rotation, that's when you begin to extract solids and phenolics. Um, if we look at the total acidity versus the sugar, the heart of the cuvee <clears throat> is much higher in total acidity before you rotate the press. As soon as you rotate, you're going to notice a drop in acidity. And at the end of the pressing, you're extracting the juice closest to the cells of the skin. Um, and that's a totally different juice. And that's why fractioning is extremely important. And that's the same for the sugar. Um, so let's have a look here at the potassium content. Um, you'll notice the potassium is lower in the cuvee. And you'll also notice that as soon as you rotate the press, which damages the skins, your potassium level drastically increases, um, which is actually quite impressive, especially when you look at the second rotation. It's like almost exponentially growing. Um, and this is totally correlated to the pH too. So <clears throat> after the second rotation, um, you also have a pH spike. So it's like a totally different juice chemistry. So this being separated is gonna help you adjust your pHs in acidity. And that's a much, it's a much smaller fraction of your cuvee. Oh, yeah. The rotations. Um, so the question is, um, how to fraction properly? Well, basically, in Champagne, there's a law which defines cuvee and taille based off of volumes, but we don't really have that issue here. So, so here's your pressing cycle in a chart. Um, you have the first cycle, and that lasts about 40 minutes. Um, and when that's finished, you deflate the bladder of the press, and we apply two rotations on the cakes. And then we go to the second cycle. Um, 
basically the take home message is that the best fractions are the first two cycles and then the second two cycles. And then the second tie um, should be a different quality program altogether. Um, keeping the second tie separate is gonna really improve the overall quality of the cube. Um, okay, so these uh, these traditional method must they're pretty complex uh, to handle. Um, first of all, they're sensitive to phenolics. Um, they get oxidized very easily, and they're also sensitive to coloring. Um, and this is a, a problem because we don't really want colored musts in our blanc de noirs. And we also want to maximize the foam quality. So this brings us to managing the phenolics in the juice. Um, what we have here is a Pinot Gris without any fining in wine number one. Uh, we went through a pinking and a browning, um, and this you'd want to treat. So in this trial, Polymus Press and Polylact was used. Polymus Press is PVPP, bentonite, and potato protein and polylact is PVPP and casein. Um, wine number two was fined after ferment, which had significantly less color um, impact on the color um, than finding before ferment. And you really want to treat the browning and pinking up front, as we did in wines three and four, where basically we juice fine. And this removed the phenolics responsible for browning and pinking beforehand. The take message is that the timing of addition is crucial, especially for color management. And this is where we explore how musk preparation is related to foam quality. So here's a photo of a very nice mousse. You have a good quantity of fine bubbles and they're homogeneous in size and there's a constant flow of them and they last on the surface and don't just pop as soon as they reach the surface of the wine. And so we know these qualities come from proteins of vegetal origin. Um, that's good, but also bad because those are heat unstable and we'll need to remove them to heat stabilize the wine and avoid protein haze in the bottle. The other class of, um, oops, the other class of, uh, of molecules which contribute to mousse quality are macromolecules derived from yeast. So that means that both um, primary and secondary fermentation is going to help you restore the mousse. And then um, the anti-foaming components from the wax and fatty acids from unhappy fermentation, and that, those can detract from mousse quality. So we need to keep those in mind um, and have a healthy ferment to really minimize the fatty acid production and maximize foam quality. <clears throat> so why am I talking about this? Um, well, basically, uh, the elaboration of a sparkling wine has a variable number of winemaking steps that can significantly alter the macromolecular composition of the wine. In particular, finding with casein and bentonite have a significant role to decrease foaming qualities. Um, this is true, but basically we found that the timing of these treatments plays a bigger role. So to illustrate that, um, I'm showing you here some results from a PhD thesis um, made at the University of Holmes in 2004, um, where moose height was measured after different treatments of bentonite. And so the chart here shows bentonite treatments um, made to finished base wine, and he measures the mousse height in millimeters and the protein content after treatment. And what happens is the more bentonite you add, the more you damage the mousse. However, the same trial was done on juice. So what happens when you treat the mess and not the wine? 
So you get rid of the proteins, but you're not necessarily damaging the mousse qualities. And the reason being is that the macromolecules coming from primary fermentation could repair the foamability of the wine. So the timing, um, of course, is best to make all the fining before fermentation. So the fining agent recommendation is entirely dependent on your grapes. Are you working with red or white grapes? Um, some varietals like Chardonnay, you might not even have to find the cuvee, um, but you could choose to find the ties. Um, but with phenolic varietals, <clears throat> you'll need to increase the dosage of the fine agent. So with colored varietals, you'll need to treat the ties with carbon, which is very widely used at a minimum dosage on the juice. And it works really well um, to optimize the non-coloring juice. And if you get mold or botrytis, you'll really just need to increase the fining agent dosage rate. <clears throat> okay, so the timing of additions is super important and the fractioning will help us reduce the amount of fining needed. So really to summarize until now, after pressing, um, we got our juice, uh, used an enzyme for depectinization, and when the te pectin test is negative for pectins, um, you let that settle for, uh, you add your juice finding agent, and then you let that settle for uh, six to 12 hours or whenever the NTU is between 60 and 140. And then you rack off the solids and you're good to inoculate for primary fermentation. And a really important point is that you can measure the quality of your work with the percent solids um, after the first racking of your juice. So if you have more than 3%, it means your process is just too brutal and you need to do something to adjust your process. Uh, and in a normal year, your percent solids would be between 1.3 and 1.4% if you're doing everything right. All right, so now that the baseline is ready, let's ferment it. So you've got two different styles you could go in for your yeast choice. Um, on the left, you have uh, choices, yeast choices really that's going to enhance your varietal aroma. And on the right, you have Zymophlora Spark, uh, which is a better choice for longer lead base. Sparks a champagne isolate. Um, it's been tested and validated by the microbiology lab at the CIBC in Champagne. And this yeast, it avoids the development of varietal aromas. Um, so really we're looking for finesse. Um, it also has a very pure and elegant and crystalline aromatic profile with nuances of white flower and citrus. And with with any yeast choice though, like you're gonna target um, 150 ppm of yin to avoid struggles in the ferment and help keep your fatty acid production at a minimum. And that's gonna optimize your foam qualities. So let's see, um, malolactic. We, we need to decide uh, our malolactic strategy. Malo or mole, Mo, no malo is the question. Um, if you're not going through malo, um, you're gonna quickly rack off the leaves after primary. Add SO2 and keep the wine very cold to avoid spontaneous malolactic fermentation. But if you want malolactic fermentation, you should have thought about that before ferment because um, this is the most difficult wine to put through ML because of low pHs, um, usually lower than 3.1. So before it has the low pH tolerance strain um, lactinose B16, it's a champagne isolate and it requires a standard build protocol to acclimatize that bacteria to the low pHs. Before it's designed this buildup culture, which consists of using some juice before your 
ferment began. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take 10 liters of your second tie juice, which has the higher pH, use half the amount of SO2, so between 30 and 35 ppm, and mix it with 10 liters of water. And then you're going to rehydrate the bacteria in this mixture with some yeast. So by the time you need to use it to inoculate your cuvee, it's almost been seven days and your baseline's about finished and you have ML bacteria already adapted to your baseline and it's fermented. So <clears throat> it'll kick off much faster and you can save a lot of energy and time. So monitor the drop of the malic acid in the ML starter and when it's about two thirds of the initial value, jump to the buildup culture, which is 5% of the volume to inoculate. Again, this is fermenting in primary fermentation and we just put in the bacteria. So when the malic goes down to about 1.5 grams per liter or two thirds depletion, you're ready to inoculate the main lot. And this is the best way really to ensure best malic, malic fermentation in the shortest amount of time. And it's also very economical. All right, so now that our wines are finished and clarified, it's time to make your blends. And they must be stabilized um, after blending, like for still wines. Um, of course, we know bentonite will affect um, the foaming properties, but if you've already been doing your due diligence to ensure uh, mousse quality is maintained, then it's fine, it's all good. It's really better just not to have a hazy sparkling wine. And new for 2020 is a product called Mana Spark. So this is a liquid mana protein product for restoring foam qualities. Um, in trials, we've found this to increase the amount of bubbles that last longer in the mousse. Um, we've also found that the bubbles are finer and thus contributing to an elegant mouthfeel. And it's liquid and it can be added to the wine before you add your tirage culture at bottling, or you can also add it to the dosage liqueur. <clears throat> So after protein stability is made, um, then you look at tartaric stability. And the problem without cold stabilizing is that you could have major issues at disgorging with gushing. Um, so really you have three choices. You could do your classic cold stabilization, but you're gonna lose some of your acidity. You could do electrodialysis, especially if you have a higher pH wine. Um, you could also use a carboxymethyl cellulose um, or cell stab. Um, and keep in mind with that, the wine needs to be heat stable to ETS standards. And also keep in mind when you send that wine out for a heat check, you need to spike the sample with 1.4% alcohol to account um, for the alcohol change that happens after bottle fermentation. And then you need to check your heat and tartaric stability. And that's about it. Um, then you're ready for tirage bottling and that's a totally different chapter. I did a webinar on these topics in February. So if you'd like a recording of that webinar, just reach out to Caitlin. And thank you so much for your time for attending. And it's currently time for questions. Let me see. Ah, so we have a question. It is, why would you have to heat stabilize a sparkling wine? Well, like still wine, um, it still can have unstable proteins in it, and those unstable proteins still have the risk of causing a haze. So generally, we just don't want hazy sparkling wine. But if you don't mind having hazy sparkling wine, then I suppose you wouldn't need to.
Any other questions? Ah, another question, here we go. Um, does barrel aging base wine help with protein stability? Definitely, especially if you do some lees stirring. Um, the manoproteins, there are manoproteins found in, um, in lees, and a lot of those manoproteins, or there's a fraction of those manoproteins that um, can contribute to heat stability. Um, but uh, no, in general, it's not really going to heat stabilize the wine. It would contribute more to cold stability than it would to heat stability. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's current research um, going on right now um, about, about those manoproteins um, in lees, but it's just really not enough to, um, to fully heat stabilize the wine. Um, another question is, how do you feel about sterile filtering to achieve tartaric stabilization? Um, well, it's just not really going to work. Um, you really only have those three options. Um, filtering doesn't contribute to tartaric stabilization. Uh, are the pHs of Pinot Noir bases generally higher? Definitely. Uh, I mean, at least with what I've noted um, in working with various base wines, um, yeah, Chardonnay tends to have lower pHs and Pinot tends to have higher pHs. Um, do you find a difference Do you find a difference in the use of manoprotein products such as Manospark and others at Tourage versus at disgorging in the dosage? Um, you know, the, the manoprotein work that has been done, um, it's very new research. And from what Francoise told me is it's better to do it after tirage. Um, you, you do see more of a difference, but um, if you didn't do it at tirage and let's say you pull out some samples um, that have been um, aging over time and you know before you decide to disgorge and you are not happy with your bubble content, then, um, then, then you have the backup option of uh, adding it at at uh, disgorging. What else? Any suggestions for a shortened cycle on a new sparkling program to compensate for lack of time on tirage? Barrel ferment, small addition of previous vintage added. Shortened cycle. So I'm thinking, yeah. So this is, it is kind of a hot topic right now in the sparkling world just because at least before the pandemic, um, sparkling was kind of just flying off the shelves. The market's very hot right now for it. And that means that there's more demand to pull those bottles aging out of tirage sooner to, um, to fulfill demand. But of course, you don't get the same kind of textural um, components um, in that wine because you have shorter time leaves aging. So yeah, I mean, there are definitely some things to help with that. Um, barrel ferment's a great idea. Um, small addition of previous vintage added, that's also a great idea. Um, I've also added um, older wine in the dosage liqueur, and that really helps bring some texture and tertiary characters um, aromatically. 
and um, uh, you know, these, um, that's something I talked about in the Tourage presentation. That's a, it's a good tool. Um, it's a manoprotein product. Um, and it's, that can contribute to uh, a surly character that you get um, over time. So it can help bring those surly characters sooner um, in the wine's life. And for that, that's a 100 ppm addition um, made at Tourage Bottling. And that can help too. Would you add manoproteins in addition to stabavin? Um, stabavin is a gum arabic um, product and that can be used at tirage or sorry at uh, disgorging so at, in your dosage liqueur um, but so i mean there's different classifications of manoproteins and different manoproteins you would use for different reasons I'm assuming when you're talking about adding something in the dosage liqueur that you would be talking about manoproteins that you would um, add into the dosage liqueur. Um, and you can absolutely add both um, if, if you want, they won't react with each other. Um, there are, so, there's um, the soluble version of enolees is called autolees and that can be added in the dosage liqueur as well um to to bring some uh some palette some mid palette weight and texture um and there's another manoprotein product called manofeel and that can also be um, included in the dosage liqueur and that's a more heterogeneous mix of different size manoproteins and it has a broader feel on the palate, um, whereas Otterly's is very mid-palate oriented and a little softer. Um, but either of those could be um, could be added in addition to Stabavin at, um, at in your dosage liqueur for contributing to mouthfeel. Um, do you find Man, there's so many questions? Um, do you find a I can't really see this very well. Do you find a difference in the use of manoprotein products, such as manospark? Oh yeah, that one I answered. I have a hard time scrolling through this. Um, another question is, I know it depends on your baseline. What would be the average timeline for barrel aging a rosé sparkling base? Um, average would be two and about two years. Um, And any suggestions for a, oh yeah, shortened cycle, I talked about that. Um, is there anything I should look for or avoid during barrel aging baseline? Well, definitely oxidation. Um, you don't want that wine to oxidize. So you wanna you know, monitor your SO2 levels and your topping. Um, anything to minimize oxidation. And that looks like that.
that's all the questions. So if you have any other questions, um, feel free to email Caitlin um, or me, um, or she can forward them to me. And uh, thank you again for all your time and participation and take care. Stay cool today, this will be a hot one. <laughs>